Hi everyone, and so good to be with you today as we finish off our Setting Things Right series where we've been looking at this sense of how we are to be people who bring justice to the earth, that we make things as they should be, that we bring God's peace, his shalom, to this world that we live on. And we've seen how when Adam and Eve messed up in the Garden of Eden, that there were four different relationships that were broken. The first was their relationship with God that they hid from him. Second was the relationship with themselves. They felt shame at what they'd done. Third was the relationship with others, that Adam and Eve fall out, and it's not long before we see murder and, and just terrible things coming into the world. And then the fourth one is that the relationship with actually their environment is broken, that thistles and weeds spring up. And we've looked at already how God wants to restore three of those relationships, our relationship with him, our relationship with ourselves, our relationship with others. And we're going to look today at how God wants us to be a force for restoring our world and making our world right. Now, I wonder whether you ever lent somebody something that was really valuable to you. We've recently had our son, Zach, has been back over from New Zealand, where he's been living for the last year and a bit. And as part of being back, he borrowed our car. And our car isn't anything particularly special. It's done almost 200,000 miles. And, uh, but it's pretty special to us, and it's quite important to our lives. And he wanted to borrow it to go up north to go and visit some friends. And it was with a little bit of fear and trepidation that he drove off with the car and I was wondering like quite what state it was going to come back in. He'd borrowed somebody else's car a while back and uh, yeah, he'd have got a bit of a scratch in it and we just thought, oh, I wonder how our car is going to be returned. Well, he brought it back brilliantly and he'd filled it up with petrol and it was great. But I wonder whether you've ever been in that place of lending something valuable to somebody and wondering whether they're going to take the same care of it that you would have done. Well, the reality is that God has gifted to us and God has put in our ownership something incredibly valuable, this planet Earth that we live on. And he created this amazing place for us to live. I remember listening to Stephen Hawking, the, the scientist, speak a while ago about how all the scientific constants, if they were even a fraction of a percent different to what they actually are, then the Earth could not have sustained Life And he was saying, although he didn't believe in God, that, that, that it seemed incredible. Um, you know, it was beyond probability that that was the way that things were worked out. But we know why those things have worked out. It's because God created this planet to sustain life and as a place that we could live and enjoy, but also a place that we could care for and tend for. And we read that about that at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1. This is the message translation. It says this, God spoke, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature so they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself and every animal that moves on the face of earth. God created human beings. He created them God-like, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. God blessed them, prosper, reproduce, fill earth, take charge. Be responsible for fish in the sea and the birds in the air, for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. God looked over everything he had made. It was good. It was so very good. And that was God's plan. It was his delight and our joy to live in this garden environment, to tend it carefully and creatively and keep it into order. And part of Adam and Eve being made in the image of God was that not only they were, in some senses, like him, but that they had his responsibility to rule and to reign. He delegated that responsibility to them, to be the ones who were going to take care of and tend for this earth. And we know that the reality is that we haven't done a great job of that. We look in our own country at the way that we treat the, the, the creation that God has given us. We read constantly in the newspapers and see online talks of sewage being poured into our rivers and that problem getting worse of when it rains, the sewage overflow just ushing, flowing out into rivers and, and ending up polluting them and killing the life that's in there. We see sewage being pumped into the sea 
and the reality that very few of the beaches in our nation are actually safe to swim in. We're seeing in our nation high temperatures coming and who remembers back to last summer? Was it the summer before when we had temperatures, you know, 40, 41 degrees and there were those days that were just utterly sweltering. And we're seeing that in our nation, but it's been seen in even more extremes around the world. As climate change takes hold, as temperatures begin to rise, as the sea levels rise, as the normal patterns of the seasons are being disrupted, then it's having an enormous impact in our world. And in this justice series, we've been exploring this idea of shalom being about justice, about bringing God's rule over the earth. Often I think when we think of shalom as we think of peace, we think of a state of peace. We think of being feeling peaceful, perhaps even zen-like in terms of how we are. But actually God's sense of shalom is, is much more whole than that. It's much more holistic than that. A guy called Perry Yoda says this, shalom in the Hebrew Bible refers primarily to be a physical state of well-being, to things as they ought to be in the material world. God's justice sets things right. It's a liberating justice. So God commissioned and equipped us to work the ground and keep it in order. And that means that every single one of us has a responsibility to steward this earth, that we're gardeners and stewards, making sure we shouldn't pollute or poison or bring harm to this earth. Now, I've recently moved to a new house. Katrina and I have moved to a new home. And the house we lived in before didn't have a garden. The back garden was just patio. And we had a few pots with things in, but they didn't tend to live for too long. And, uh, but we've now moved to a house that has garden all the way around it. And I'm discovering that gardens grow really fast. We were really looking forward to having a garden, but then stuff just keeps growing. And, uh, you know, the lawn seems like you've just mowed it and then it needs mowing again. It's all sprung up again. And the, the borders that the previous owner attended and cared for, there's weeds coming up. And we're thinking, blimey, we need to get out there and, and work out what are the weeds and what are the plants to keep it looking as nice as it was when we moved in. And we know that if we don't look after this world, if we neglect it or even abuse it, then things will get worse. And that's what we're seeing. Mary Robinson, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, said this, I realised that climate change was no longer a scientific abstraction. It wasn't just something that the scientists were looking at and going, well, this is interesting. Oh, watch this. But it's a man-made phenomenon that impacted people, primarily the most vulnerable all over the world. Though these communities were the least responsible for the emissions causing climate change, they were disproportionately affected because of their already vulnerable geographic locations and their lack of climate resilience. What she's saying is that, that actually the people who are least responsible for climate change, the people who haven't burnt the fossil fuels, who haven't you know, done all the stuff that we've done, are the people who are most feeling the impact of it. Many of you will know that for years we supported an HIV AIDS project in Zambia, in Serenji, in the north of Zambia up in the Copper Belt. And one of the things even back then, 15 years ago, that we observed was that the climate was changing for those farmers who were in Serenji. And the rains that used to come every year in October and November that they could just rely on that were vital, essential for their well-being, um, just weren't coming. They, they were becoming less and less re reliable. And, and those people had paid little in terms of actually causing climate change. It wasn't their fault, but they were paying the price for what was happening. And Perry Yoda says that God's justice, as we seek to bring God's justice, has two elements. He says this, first God's justice delivers the underclass from their oppression and transforms their situations. Second, God's justice judges the oppressors. It shatters the power which enables them to oppress. So these two elements to God bringing justice and us bringing God's justice, one is to lift up the oppressed, to undo the effect of the injustice, but it's secondly to, to speak judgment, to speak reality to those who've been oppressors, to actually sit in judgment over that. And we know that there's a day coming when Jesus will come again and he will make all things right on that day. He will set everyone who's been oppressed free 
He will release captives and, and everything will be as it will be. The, the earth will be restored. The Bible says that there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And it doesn't mean a fresh one. It means a renewed version of this one. And heaven and earth will come together again. And as we read in the book of Revelation, that there is a garden again in the new city, the new Jerusalem, where we will dwell for eternity with God. And there is coming a day when God will set all things right and all injustice will be judged. There will be a day of judgment where everyone who has oppressed others will face their judgment. And that day is coming, but, but God says that we are to be people who bring heaven to earth. That we don't wait for that day. We don't just hang around and go, well, it's not worth doing anything with this earth. Let's just, you know, like use it up and abuse it. No, God says that he wants his justice to begin to work out now. Um, not waiting for what is going to come. And God says that we are to be those justice bringers. We're to be his hands and feet on this earth earth. And in 2021, we looked at this issue of creation care. And I must admit that Christians have come late to this party. You know, for years, Christians have viewed, you know, people from the, the Greens and the tree huggers and, you know, those sorts of people have viewed them with suspicion. And well, this isn't something that Christians should be involved in. You know, we've got far weightier matters. And we are going to be a church which is focused on salvation, which is focused on Jesus, which is focused on setting our relationship with him right. You know, we said that at the beginning, that the first relationship to break when Adam and Eve sinned was their relationship with God. And that actually is the most fundamental relationship. That's the one that is um, fundamental to the other three being restored. It begins with restoring our relationship with God. And that is a message as a church that we will never lose. But tied in with that are these other relationships that we need to look to be part of restoring. We need to think about things like mental health and our relationship with ourselves. We need to think about being peacemakers in the world as we see the situation in Israel and Gaza and even in our own local lives. And we need to be those who are bringing justice as injustice is done in creation. And in 2021, we did a whole series where we looked at this issue of creation care. And it was um, the first time, I think, as a church, we'd ever really talked about this as an issue, certainly in the 30 plus years that I've been part of Kerith. And we declared a climate emergency. We said, as a church, we recognize that this is a huge issue. It's a huge issue because we've, de we've, we've abandoned our responsibility to care for the earth. And it's a huge issue because the people who are most oppressed by this are the most vulnerable. And we're to be justice bringers into the earth. And we've been doing a whole lot of work since that. As a, as a, as a church, on a sort of corporate level, we've been applying for these La Rocha awards on each of our sites. And I'm pleased to say that in Bracknell and Farnborough and Windsor, we've concentrated on the three sites that have buildings. We've won bronze awards, recognizing the steps that we've taken towards being more responsible in this area. And we're gonna to look to upgrade those bronze awards to silver and gold and get those awards similarly on the Isle of Wight. And we've taken a whole load of changes and made a whole load of changes ourselves. So I know people who've invested in electric cars or, or cars that are just more efficient, more kind to the environment. You know, we've been focused on recycling and food recycling and recycling our waste. I know people who've moved their savings and pensions into ethical funds. I know people who've installed heat pumps and solar panels and batteries in their homes. I know people who've um, moved away from meat-based diets and Katrina and I have been having more vegetarian diets, not all the time, but more of the time. Going, hey, this is the direction that we need to move in. I know people who've been insulating their homes, traveling on public transport more, cycling, walking, um, all sorts of changes that people have made in order that we might personally live more sustainable lifestyles. And as well as working locally, and I want to encourage us to continue to do those things in an increasing measure. You know, they're all over our news, the steps that we know that we should be taking. And I want to encourage you to be thinking, hey, what are the things that I'm doing? Could I do more? You know, sometimes we can be overwhelmed by the need. There seems to be so much need. And well, what difference is it going to make if I switch a few meals or, or walk rather than use the car? Well, God doesn't call us to fix the big problem. 
God calls us to what we can do with the resources and the, the influence that we have. And I want to encourage you to be thinking about that. And we've really so far on this process thought about working locally. And we've been thinking around our sites, how do we work more sustainably? But we want to begin to think wider of how do we begin to impact the world and bring change in the wider world. And uh, to that extent, we're going to be partnering with um, a tier fund project. Tier fund is an aid organization we've partnered with for years. And we're going to be partnering with them to make a real difference in Nigeria, in a region in the north of Nigeria. And we know that all around the world, um, the issue of waste and the issue of rubbish is an enormous one. Recent research from Tear Fund reported that 218 million people are at risk of more frequent and more severe flooding due to plastic pollution, that plastic pollution is clogging up rivers and clogging up streams and causing flooding. That's equivalent to the population of the UK, France and Germany. They also report this 2 billion people in the world's poorest countries are living and working amongst piles of waste because they don't have rubbish collections. You know, in wealthy countries like ours, people come and take away the rubbish. And we've been doing that more responsibly, haven't we, with all our different bins. And uh, I'm in that very confusing place where we've just moved from Bracknell to Ashvale. And the bins are different colours for different things. In Bracknell, the green bin um, was for general waste. Now in Farnborough, the, the green bin is for recycling. We're just working our way through that. But we've started to make changes. And, you know, occasionally we see a bit of litter, but it's nothing that bad. But around the world, there are places where there's no rubbish collections and all the rubbish just ends up on the streets and in the fields and in the rivers. And we've been hearing as a church about, um, or as leaders, about an amazing project that's happening in Nigeria. Um, it's a project that's working amongst young people and um, empowering young people to make a difference. And it's got three elements to it. The first one is that plastic waste is being collected and repurposed and recycled. And we were hearing recently from Joseph, who's the, the, the country rep for Tear Fund for Nigeria. And he was saying in this community where this project has been running, um, there used to be a massive problem with waste just everywhere in the streets and everywhere. But now because of this project, actually plastic waste has a value. It's worth something and the, the waste has just disappeared because people have realised that they can pick it up and actually turn it into, you know, it's financially beneficial for them to do that. So part of this project is taking plastic waste to repurpose and recycle it. Part of the project is taking food waste and turning it into compost. And then part of that composting is creating organic liquid fertilisers by composting, com composting the bio-waste rather than the people having to buy inorganic fertilisers. One of the things that we saw when we did the project in Serenji was that the farmers were very de dependent on these inorganic fertilisers, which were expensive and actually long-term damaged the soil. They might cause the crops to grow in the short term, but longer term, they were unsustainable. And part of this project is to produce liquid fertilisers from this bio-waste, which are much more sustainable and much more um, are good for the land. So I want to show you a little project, a little video around that project, and then we'll come back and we'll wrap up. So let's watch that video now. Our world has a rubbish problem. We're facing mountains of it. It's gathering in rivers, piling up in cities, collecting in the streets and flooding communities. Two billion of us, one in four, have no way to get rid of it, forced to live among it with no option but to dump or burn it. That releases toxic fumes, damaging people's health, choking neighbourhoods and our climate, and causing up to one million deaths a year. And all the while it piles higher, our addiction to single-use plastics adding to the heap. But in the face of the crisis, Jesus, you speak.
seen uh, young people come up with very innovative ideas, uh, for example, how they can uh, create uh, organic manure from waste, and this can then be sold um, to generate income uh, for those who are farming in their farms. So instead of using uh, fertilizer that would pollute the soil, they'll use organic fertilizer uh, produced from waste. Uh, we also have another group of young people uh, called the Yola Renewal Foundation. Through partnership with this group, uh, we've been able to come up with uh, a project to address um, plastic waste through recycling. We are creating uh, green jobs um, through uh, a social enterprise which uh, the youth have established in Yola town, which is the capital of Adamawa state. Uh, in the northeast part of the country. Uh, so far, more than 1,000 households um, have benefited from this project uh, where they're able to earn some income to support them, access food, take their children to school, pay for uh, health care, and all that. So it has impacted positively on the lives of these households. And I think uh, this is one project that um, we are proud of and we would want to continue to support. It's amazing, isn't it, what's happening there and how God is moving in that community. And we want to get involved in that project. And we've set ourselves the goal as a community of raising £10,000 a year for the next three years. Now, some of that money is going to come from some of our, our building fund tithes, uh, particularly from Bracknell. Um, we're going to put some of their building fund tithes towards that project. But uh, there are two other ways that we want to raise money for that project. And one is this, that we're encouraging people to do sponsored events. Now, maybe you might have your kids who would love to do something like this, or your grandkids. Um, I'm hoping to do a half marathon early next year, and I don't normally get sponsored for those, but this time around, I'm going to get sponsored for this project and to raise money. And you might want to do something like that, something which actually helps to raise awareness with other people of what's happening here and the difference that this project is making. So we want to raise some of the money from um, our, our building fund tithes, some of the money from sponsored projects, and then there may well be people in our community who would just love to give to this project, who would go, hey, I'd love to pour some of my finances into what's happening and be part of the change in this place. And if you would like to do that, uh, I want to encourage you to go to our webpage, go to the giving page, and in the drop downs, you can choose what you want your giving to go to, and you can choose creation, care, and justice, and make a donation that way. Um, so why not consider doing one of those things? Do a sponsored event, do a run, or a walk, or you know whatever else it is you fancy doing. Find some way of actually raising resources and raising the profile of this project or maybe you just want to give directly and uh, whether you can give a few pounds or hundreds of pounds or even thousands of pounds all of it will be channeled towards this project in tier fund and if we raise more than ten thousand pounds it will allow us to do more than they thought they were going to do so there we have it we've come to the end of the series and i want to encourage you to be a force for justice in our world, to be part of putting things right. Be part of putting things right in terms of helping other people to discover a relationship with Jesus Christ. Be playing your part in telling other people about what it means for you to be a follower of Jesus, how that's transformed your life and inviting them to take next steps, thinking the Isaiah 61 steps of sharing your life, sharing your faith and sharing Jesus. Let's bring justice by helping people to be well within themselves, thinking about things like mental health and how do we make a difference and help people with their mental health? How do we help people with their physical health? How do we help people to know shalom and wholeness within themselves? Let's be peacemakers in the wider world. Sometimes that seems vast as we think of you know, Israel and the Gaza Strip or we think of Ukraine and Russia. Hey, we can be praying for those situations and our prayers are powerful, but we can also be working locally where we see discord, where we see breakdown, to be peacemakers, to bring peace into community, to reconcile and bring people together. And then let's look to be bringers of justice as we set things right in our relationship with creation 
and let's be doing the little things that we can do. But let's also take the big steps and, as we've said, through this Tear Fund project, get involved in what's happening in the nations and making a difference there. So again, we can make a difference. We are already making a difference and we can all play our part in making things right, in making things as they should be, as we long for that day when Jesus comes again and all is made well. So I hope you're well. Hope you have a great week and catch you again soon.